Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'll go ahead and begin the presentation in about two minutes. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, webinar on uh, witness protection. Today's program is presented by Equitas. Uh, my name is John Wilkinson, and I'm an attorney advisor with Equitas, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. The webinar is being recorded uh, and will be available for future viewing if you have uh, colleagues uh, in your office who uh, might want to uh, view this content. Uh, if you have a question during the presentation, please enter it into the chat box. The chat function is at the bottom of your screen and a chat box typically appears on the right side of the screen or it might float in the screen. Uh, you can contact us directly at any time following today's presentation and we'll send you contact information during our follow-up. Uh, just quickly about Equitas, our mission is to improve the quality of justice by developing, evaluating, and refining prosecution practices that increase victim safety and offender accountability. As a national training and technical assistance provider, Equitas develops resources, conducts trainings like this one, and offers 24 seven consultations for prosecutors and allied professionals. For more information on Equitas, please visit our website at equitasresource.org. You can also follow Equitas on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And those uh, links are available on our website. Uh, today's webinar is supported by the U.S. Department of Justice's Bureau of Justice Assistance. The information presented in this webinar does not necessarily reflect the views of the Bureau of Justice Assistance. This is part of the Equitas Innovative Prosecution Solutions Initiative, uh, focusing on witness protection as part three of a three-part series related to witness intimidation. Uh, if you haven't seen the part one or part two, that won't affect this presentation but you can uh, view those by going on our website and uh, clicking on those links, they were recorded as well. Presenting our webinar today is uh, Steve Siegel. Uh, Steve is the Director Emeritus of the Special Programs Unit of the Denver District Attorney's Office, uh, which uh, he did for over 10 years and just retired, I think last year. Uh, Steve has uh, served as an advisor and consultant in the US and abroad on policy development and interagency collaboration. He was a developer supervisor and currently he consults with the Denver District Attorney's Office of Witness Protection, their office's witness protection program. The program has been recognized by the Department of Justice and the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys as a national model and has served approaching 400 cases. Steve and his team uh, have provided technical assistance to 50 cities of all sizes in support of developing witness protection programs. Uh, additionally, Steve uh, has served as a team leader in crisis response to the Columbine uh, High School shooting. He also has supported uh, response efforts for other mass tragedies, such as the Oklahoma City Murrah Building bombing, uh, the 9-11 tragedy, Sandy Hook, the Boston Marathon bombing, the Aurora uh, County theater shootings, amongst many others. Uh, he created the Denver Victim Services Network designated by the U.S. Department of Justice as a national model. 
He's one of the primary authors of the city's interagency protocols on domestic violence, sexual assault, child sex abuse, human trafficking, victimization of the elderly and disabled, uh, many of which include victim witness protection. Steve has received many uh, awards and honors uh, over the years. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, turn this over to Steve. When you all have questions, please chat them in and I'll go ahead and uh, read those to Steve as, as they come up. Uh, so Steve, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, John, and welcome to everyone. Uh, you know, I have something in common with my granddaughter now. She's doing all of her learning and stuff on the computer, and now she knows that I am also. And so she asked me the other day if she could help write my material. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll let you write. Why don't you do something for the opening? And so she said, Poppy, I can write a joke. So I said, well, you know, we're talking about criminal justice stuff. So this is what she sent me. If a child refuses to sleep during nap time, are they guilty of resisting arrest? So I can't hear any laughing, but I laughed when I heard it. Welcome all. Uh, we're gonna try to go through the uh, main principles of building a witness protection program. I believe uh, the most important thing for you to hear today is that what I'm talking about is not what we did in Denver or what we can do in Denver, but really the universal principles that would apply in any jurisdiction across the United States, be it large, small, urban, rural, or whatever. These are principles of what you need to do in order to build and maintain a strong witness protection program. And I, uh, I can reveal my prejudice up front None of this can be done alone as a district attorney's office. It must be built on the back of partnerships, real live partnerships, collaborations with other criminal justice, non-criminal justice, community-based agencies. So with that in mind, let's uh, jump in here. And all of our cases start with a threat assessment that we have to determine if there's an imminent and credible threat against the life of this victim or witness. And we have to do that by sorting out uh, fact from fiction, from myth, from reality. And we have a process that we use to do that, including a dynamic screening tool. Uh, and when I say dynamic, I don't mean it's just fantastic. I mean that it's something that is never completed. There's always a need to be updating, double checking, uh, reaching to the second and third and fourth level for the information that helps you make that decision about building a witness protection uh, concept for a particular case. And to add to that, no approaches, no programs that we do uh, from one case to another are ever the same. So with our assessment tool protocol, we have to start with where the family is at. And in, in the vast majority of our cases in Denver, uh, we have mostly folks who are uh, in a circumstance where they need support in solving life's problems. Uh, and oftentimes they have had their own run-ins with uh, the criminal justice system. But we do have those cases where Ma and Pa Kettle get in the middle of something and we have to determine uh, a program of moving forward that acknowledges that they are likely to stay in the area, they are likely to keep their jobs, they are likely to stay around their family, and so it's a, a pretty broad range of safety plan development that we have to use. Again, the bottom line being is what actions our agency or your agency will need to take to keep this person or family safe. And when I say safe, I don't mean just for the duration of the trial or the criminal justice process, but going from the day that you find out about this till often long after uh, 
um, particularly when offenders are placed in uh, the Department of Corrections for long periods of time, and they really have not much else to do but to focus on revenge. So it's important to understand that the length of a program is not necessarily tied to the length of the criminal justice process. When we're collecting this initial information, we're working very closely with uh, the police department, particularly the detective division and their intelligence bureau to put together the data that defines the key players in this, both on the victim witness side and the offender side, that we're looking at things like criminal history, known associations, the geographical locations of where people are found to be at the current time, and of course, the types of crimes that we're dealing with. There is a direct correlation between the length of prison or severity of, of consequences and the motivation of an offender or an offender's uh, group, gang, family, whatever it is, uh, to want to intervene and cause harm. When we're collecting information, I should add this in here. Our unit, and I, forgive me, our unit is uh, I, being retired now. Uh, our unit is their unit, except when I'm consulting. But when we're doing this, we're collecting personal information and we do it in a way that we have put a wall between ourselves and the prosecution team. We do not want to end up uh, as witnesses in this case. We do not want to end up as an outside agent to impact the criminal justice system beyond our job of keeping people safe. And those of you who are attorneys in the room, um, the virtual room, we have a statute in Colorado that protects and holds uh, confidential the materials that we put together uh, in order to determine the nature of our witness protection program. And so that statute has been uh, attacked, oh, I don't know, a half a dozen or so times. And, uh, the courts have upheld the, the uh, quality of the writing of the statute and, of course, its constitutionality. Some of these things may uh, surprise you that we're looking into things like, do they own storage units or is there daycare involved? Um, and I'm going to focus you just on the last few words of this slide, which is, if in fact a victim or witness is a confidential informant in a pending case, they are not, I repeat, they are not eligible for our program. If they have made a decision that their livelihood is based on being out in the criminal world in order to collect information and to uh, share that information with law enforcement in order to make money, or to get consideration, that is not a circumstance that we can overcome because we're looking to help them build a safe and sound and productive lifestyle. Uh, and we have just found that that is not conducive, that is not um, something that can be done if you are choosing to continue a lifestyle as a confidential informant. Okay, let's go back to that threat assessment. So after the data is collected, the initial data is what I should say, uh, and it's taken into consideration, we need to put our own subjective assessment onto the offender or the offender group's motivation to cause harm and their capacity to cause harm. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, trash talk and woofing that goes on in, in that world. But the real uh, determinant for us is whether they have capacity to carry out these threats. If there's not a credible imminent threat, that does not mean we close the case 
And that does not mean that we're done. It just means that we have to monitor the current situation. And if pieces of the puzzle change, uh, we have to, again, use that dynamic approach to our screening and make sure that uh, additional actions don't have to be reinstated or taken uh, because circumstances have changed. So if we go to this place, if a credible imminent threat is there and it is there to our satisfaction, then there are different kinds of threats which start with geographical threats. I'm not sure I understand why or how it's this way, but it seems as though with a significant number of our cases, if we remove the people who are under threat from a geographical location and don't take them very far, keep it confidential where it is, but they don't have to go cross country, that we can in fact resolve all of the problems that we're currently facing. Sometimes that is not the case and there are extraordinary lengths that we have to go to in order to make sure that we are taking them out of harm's way. Often case the threat is only based on the opportunism uh, of the offender or the offender's supporters seeing or running into the victim witness. And so we have a particular concern as always on court days uh, or other days where there are criminal justice uh, actions being taken place, including when they come down to our office or if we go out to them uh, to do interviews. And so there is a very um, 101 law enforcement up to graduate school in law enforcement commitment to tactical skill sets. And uh, this is a good point for me to tell you that our best friend in building and maintaining this program has been the expertise of the U.S. Marshals uh, WITSEC unit. They have done everything from train us on technology to strategies to handle the fiscal end of what we do, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, all the way up to provision of, of cameras, um, courses on executive protection, driving skills, all of those kinds of things that those of you in law enforcement know a heck of a lot better than I do. But I've got to tell you that the U.S. Marshals, whether you know this or not, are, have a organizational commitment to support local efforts in witness protection. As with everything, it's about building relationships with your local folks uh, to get them committed to really giving you the best that they can offer you in the way of support. Our local U.S. Marshal's Office has been fantastic. None of this works without an understanding of the uh, parallel proceedings, if I can, of the realities of understanding what the victim services professionals in your office and in your community do. And they are addressing with those individuals and families the five major impacts of crime, violent crime on victims. And that's obviously physical, but emotional, financial, and the two that most people don't talk about, the social aspects, the isolation, uh, particularly when you're put in witness protection, and the spiritual, that you question those things that you may have thought spiritually before you became exposed to this kind of violence or threat. So we rely heavily on victim services to understand that side of it, of it and to advise us on how it may impact the style of program we're developing. And then this is the third leg on that three-legged stool. Okay, so we have tactical approaches, 
we have victim services approach, approaches, and we have lifestyle changes. And in this particular area, I'm talking about for us, the vast majority of the numbers of cases that we have. Our people who we are protecting often present issues of self-esteem, substance abuse, victimization through human trafficking, dysfunctional families, and challenges educationally and vocationally. And if we're going to live by the code that we say we have for witness protection, we need to understand that we have as much commitment to these kinds of opportunities, and that's an important word, that we create the opportunities for people to grow in these areas of self-esteem, substance abuses, getting out of the human trafficking world, uh, dysfunctional families that may not help them and in fact can uh, be a part of harming them, uh, and then educational and vocational opportunities. And I, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of um, uh, war stories as they may be, but I will tell you that in uh, the number one case where we had to, uh, I'm gonna take you to the extreme of what we have to do in an intervention. This was a case where uh, it was related to the cartels, the drug cartels. The young woman who became our client, our person that we were protecting, was dating uh, an arm in Colorado of the uh, Sinaloa cartel. And uh, he, aside from that involvement, was also beating her within the relationship. And so she had some real issues with self-esteem uh, from the way he was making her feel. And she was hiding in uh, substance abuse to deal with her pain. It became too much for her when he suggested that she might earn some extra money for their relationship by uh, dating men that he could arrange. It became dysfunctional family because we came to find out through our investigations that in fact, her uncle, this is the victim's uncle, was the link to the cartel and the one who arranged this relationship. And so we knew we were gonna to have to move her to a new location, separate her, change her name, change everything that has to do with her life. And that includes her medical circumstances. Uh, she had college credits, she had a work history, she had financial obligations, she had three pets, she owned a house, she owned a car. And so we undertook a slow but steady approach to rebuilding a life for her. Uh, we're now five years out. She is in a, I'm sorry, we're seven years out. She is in a different city. She has a uh, full-time job. She has been through a whole lot of therapy uh, and is now virtually attending her first semester of law school. And so that's the level that we may go to in order to bring about lifestyle change. And we cannot do that from the, even though we call our, our key players on our team investigators with big hearts, they do not have the professional capacity to take on that level of lifestyle change. And so we were able to develop resources in another town uh, to provide the support counseling, uh, direction, assistance from really top-notch professionals in that town, and then supported by the president of the university in Colorado that was willing to transfer credits in a different name without knowing why, just at our request, uh, provide medical histories to uh, people in the new location, to deal with our substance abuse and subsequent 
physical ailments that she had from that and on and on. So I'm weaving a very complex web of what can happen when you enter into folks' lives for the purpose of protecting them, but your underpinning is that you are there for their lives to get better over time with your support. You can't talk about any of this stuff, any of it, without an acknowledgement of the role of trauma on the brain. And I'm not going to do an hour's lecture on that. Um, we're working with a group that's dealing with uh, mass tragedies and environmental crime. And we're training all of our investigators and all of our prosecutors on trauma-informed approaches to working with folks. Because if you miss that, so many of the things over at least my 43 years in the business, during that time, you see different kinds of behavior and behavior that's not logical for what you think a victim would, would, um, would be going through or displaying. And a lot of that, a great deal of that, is due to the impact of trauma on the brain. Substance abuse and mental health folks point to this very well in this slide that you need to understand the impact of trauma in order to find or help someone find a path to recovery. You need to respond by understanding the basic principles and how they apply to your job. So if you're a, a lawyer, a prosecutor, or if you're an investigator, or you're a victim advocate, or you're a drug and alcohol counselor, or whatever it is, you need to understand that there is a profession and a and a set of principles that give you the ability to provide trauma-informed services, whatever that profession is. You need to be able to recognize signs of trauma. Uh, and we're not going to do a lot of that, but there's plenty of good material out there. Equitas probably has some of it. And you need to do on the tactical side, which is uh, you're going to have a much worse witness victim if in fact they are subjected to a lot of re-traumatization during the period of pendency of the criminal case. So we'll flip through those. Hope no one's getting seasick. Okay, so these are the principles that are included in trauma-informed care and this is your behavior towards them that you acknowledge that you're there and can provide them with a path to safety. You, people say, um, so you have a witness protection program, you protect everyone. And we say, no, we help individuals protect themselves. And it may be a subtle or, or linguistic approach, but it's not we really have to have that partnership with the individuals uh, that we are helping them help themselves. And we start that uh, by building a relationship and building a sense of trustworthiness uh, with our clients. And that's done through transparency. It's done through our collaborations. It's done through concepts of providing people with choice, letting them understand that they have control back over their lives. You know, the, the more popular word now is empowerment, but it's really about control over their own lives. They have been uh, thrust or they have thrust themselves into a circumstance of uh, loss of control, circumstances that they can't control. And so giving them a sense back and a, uh, a guided path back to how they can slowly but surely take back control, or maybe for the first time in their lives, take control of their lives. And the, the kind of surrounding bubble of all of that are cultural, historical, and gender-related issues uh, that may come into play in an individual case. Now we're going to bounce you around a little bit since I 
talk through the slide changes. So some of that can come about because you do take on uh, either reading or training or uh, finding out about existing curriculum about trauma-informed, or it can come about from having a multidisciplinary approach uh, to your witness protection work that is trauma-informed. And uh, a little caveat here, the more you build partnership into what it is you're doing with community agencies, you have to have a second level of concern and planning to in fact keep those agencies safe. And so one more uh, case example is we had a, a case come to us that was a young woman who was married to a gang member. Uh, she was being beaten by him uh, and had had enough. During the same window of time, uh, this young man sold his sister, who was um, fairly impacted by learning disabilities and cognitive disabilities. He sold her to the other members of his gang for a, uh, a gang bang, I guess is the only way I know how to describe it. It was a horrible circumstance and rape of this young woman, 12 years old. And uh, the young man and his mother made it be known to the daughter-in-law and daughter uh, that if they cooperated with law enforcement, they were gonna face death. And so we had a new client, uh, family, and that was the 21-year-old daughter-in-law and the daughter who had decided to go forward in their lives together and try to find a new life. The 21 year old was pregnant with a high risk pregnancy and the 12 year old was now three or four weeks behind in her schooling, uh, special ed schooling. And so we had to deal with medical personnel and educational personnel, which is not our wheelhouse, and we had to do that in a way that we were protecting the educational environment and children's hospital um, where both of them were seeking care for the pregnancy and the aftermath of the sexual assault. So this integrated multimodal, everyone involved in that approach, in fact, had been through trauma-informed cultural training and it gave them the ability to do a better job in the basic service they provide. Utilizing resources, that's kind of the story I just told you. But victim advocacy, local law enforcement, social services, me medical services, educational services, um, job support, we often are able to utilize our local unions and they will contact unions in the cities where we're moving people to help people get a job that can help cover the actual costs of relocation and establishing a new life in a new place. So we are nothing without having a network of resources uh, that we can rely on on a case-by-case -case basis. Before I go on to this part, which is about those relationships, John, do we have any questions collected? Uh, Steve, um, we had one uh, question, well, one question that sort of suggested some questions to me, but one was, can we get a copy of the Colorado statute that you mentioned earlier that uh, affords uh, some privacy to uh, information that victims share with you? And uh, we can certainly send that to uh, everybody. Actually, the statute is confidential, so no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes, we can, we can send it on to John and he can distribute it. And um, so it just uh, made me think, um, be, 
your witness protection program at the Denver DA's office, did it pre-exist that statute? And were there things you did prior to the statute to, you talked about creating a wall between you and the office. Were there specific things that were part of that wall or things you did prior to the statute being uh, enacted or things you continue to do even with the statute? Yeah, in reality, our um, effort to have a, a unit was kind of an airplane built in the air. Uh, this came about because uh, I don't, you know, here we are in the first week of football. But back in the day, we had a young man who played defensive back from, uh, he was from Houston, Texas and was a first round draft choice of the Broncos. And on one fateful New Year's Eve, he was shot and killed by a gang member. And this was prior to the existence of uh, witness protection statutes. And uh, it was a very high profile case, both in the news and all of the witnesses to this case were names that you would recognize if you were a football fan and some names you'd recognize even if you weren't and you uh, watch TV or read People magazine. And so that was when we realized that we needed uh, to develop a program and it actually predated the statute. And so we were walking a plank in those days, but it made us realize that we were really in danger in the long term uh, if we didn't build a statute. And so we were able to, of course, work with our district attorney's council. Uh, frankly, it was another day. I don't know what uh, the legislative approach to these things would be in, in our kind of upside down world right now. But we built this funding base, which creates uh, state funding for witness protection, as well as the confidentiality uh, of the work that's done as well as a three person state board to kind of keep everyone on track. Because we're, we're out here in the wild west. Uh, I'm actually speaking to you from beautiful Grand Lake, Colorado, but we're out here in the wild west and we like local control. And so we built a statute that allowed for local control, but also statewide consistency and protection uh, in order to do the job in a quality manner and do it in a way that was the same, no matter what the jurisdiction was. Um, but the statute is really an important piece of what we do. And it also keeps things um, safe and sound within the office because people know they can't come down the hall to Rick Harris's office. They can't come down the hall in my days to me and say, hey, What's going on with Sarah Smith? What, what, what do I need to worry about? I heard a rumor that she was uh, using heroin in the past. Is that true? Uh, folks don't do that because they know uh, the integrity with which we stick to our principles of confidentiality within the office. Does that kind of get to where you're going, John? Yeah, yeah. I just thought that might be helpful for people to know a yeah. little it's an important piece, a really important piece to uh, how you move forward. All right. So if we're going to build this kind of collaboration, and for those of you who are around the grant world, I don't use that word collaboration lightly. It is not that throwaway term that you have to put in every funding request and every grant. And I'm talking about true collaborations where people are bought into uh, the universal principles of what you're doing. And you get that by developing a shared vision of what you're trying to accomplish, that everybody understands each other's professions and the limitations of their professions. I can't go to this person's therapist necessarily and say, how is she doing? Is she lying to me about this? Those kinds of things are uh, important, elemental to building the collaborations that you need for witness protection. Obviously commitment, it's easy to get scared if you're not in this business, if you're not doing this all the time. 
the people who come to the table need to know that when they have a conversation and express their concerns as a, a community-based victim services program or a jobs program, that that concern will be carried by our staff to the highest levels of our office. In other words, it's direct representation of anything that's done in those planning meetings. And in fact, no one's bought into something where they give up control over their own program. The decision-making power for each agency remains, is not abdicated to this new group. You need to have structure. It's not a y'all come and we'll see what we get to talk about. If there's training involved, there's a, the sharing of, of concerns, there's uh, co-applications for grant funds, uh, there are political concerns where you can help out and build relationships. You need to make sure that these agencies that you're asking to do things are funded to do those things. When we were bringing a uh, in danger 21 year old high risk pregnancy young woman to Children's Hospital, we needed to make sure that we knew how to get her covered by insurance so that Children's Hospital uh, could work with her to do everything that needed to be done. And again, throughout all of that is trust between relationships. And boy, we are in a challenged place these days about trust. Uh, and I think that uh, recommitting to the ideas of trust and rebuilding relationships is going to go pretty close to the top of those of that list that's in front of you. Uh, as we move forward. Uh, we can probably do a couple of days on uh, planning for change. So I'm gonna pop through some of this. Uh, I, my first question that I always ask when we're bringing together a group to deal with a, a new case, and you know, it's not just a witness protection committee, it's a case specific committee. Let me say that again. Every case we do brings a different group to the table for that particular case, rather than it just being a generic person from the Denver Victim Service Center or from the Race Rape Crisis Center or from the Union or from the Emily Griffith School. It's a new group. And so we're always asking this question that came to me from a planning model out of MIT, which is who's not here? Who do we need at this table in order to build the best possible collaboration for this case? And these are the factors that may come into, a, into play. Um, we don't want, I, I love interns and as a, a former professor at CU Graduate School. Uh, I adore the concept of inter internship programs, but we don't send a college intern to sit in on these meetings. It's people who have influence within their sphere and their agency. I'm gonna skip that. The group needs to be really honest and transparent about setting priorities for how we're going to build a witness protection blanket for this family or individual. And part of that is the last point on this slide, which is there are natural and healthy conflicts that will come about from the group, such as the number one, particularly for those who are not criminal justice agencies, if I help you, what's the safety to my agency? What's the threat to safety to my institution? And so those are the kinds of things that we're always dealing with in setting our priorities. There's a great tool that you can access on your own uh, from Colorado State University, particularly this is for those of you who do not have a long, uh, comfortable history of collaborations or collaborations on witness protection. And this is called 
the community readiness model for change. It's on the csu.edu website under the Tri-Ethnic Research Center. Tri-Ethnic Research Center. And we can make that available, uh, the contact information available again through John after this is done. But the beauty of this model is it's not are you ready or are you not ready, but for every one of these two, four, six, eight, nine items, there are strategies that help you grow uh, what might be a barrier and turn it into a strength. And so I, we have found this readiness model to be really helpful in building uh, the kind of common commitment that we want in these collaborations. And it certainly was helpful because we do have an overall group that looks at witness protection and victims issues. Um, and many of those members are survivors. Uh, they ask tough questions. And so we need to be able to come up with smart and honest answers uh, to help us build these relationships. We kind of talked about that. Yeah, uh, I use the word collaboration, um, but partnerships are great in terms of, we all understand in the relationships we have with either family or, or marriages or friendships or any kind of relationship, uh, where the strengths lie in those relationships. And it's all often, if not always, because we have this commitment to a partnership, a real honest partnership. And I can't overemphasize that. Um, it's just something that all have to believe. It's not for the benefit of the district attorney's office. It's for the benefit of our community. Uh, this is to you and those of you who are watching this who might take a leadership role. Uh, leadership is not self-initiating. It is something that someone needs to step up and do for real. Um, back in the late 90s when we were building our victim services network collaboration, uh, another city that had that opportunity uh, south of here had a fantastic leader who was really committed to those programs. And uh, something came up where he, as the elected official in that jurisdiction, in fact, took on the prosecution of an elected official and he stepped out of his leadership role. And that program over the course of less than six months collapsed. So I do not understate the need for leadership and continued leadership to build and make sustainable the services that you're looking to provide. Elements of leadership, competence, reliability, integrity, and the one that we always screw up, communications. We seem to have a massive ability to under communicate or miscommunicate. And so extra attention, extra love and care has to be spent on communicating and making sure that the circle of communication is complete. Um, I uh, had a boss early in my career who thought I was completely bonkers because I loved conflict. I love to go into the middle of a meeting where there is unresolved conflict because to me, it seems as though it's a really clear path to building relationships, finding a way to understand conflict, to understand it from the other side's viewpoint and to find a common ground to resolve that conflict so that everyone wins uh, is a great tool 
to building the kind of trust and relationships that are literally life and death in witness protection. And again, I probably have gone this long without saying this. This is a life and death program. This is not just another piece that goes on an elected official's brochure. Uh, this is not just another piece that you can say you've got a part-time investigator and they're going to do this work and call it a program. That is not, that is not the way you build a witness protection program. And that is the way you get a very hard lesson about life and death. Uh, and of the cities that we've gone to, there have unfortunately been those cities uh, that liked the idea, they thought it was politically expedient, they thought it was good for one case, uh, and underbuilt a program, and that ended in people being harmed and in uh, more than one case, people dying. So we start all this with a planning process. Uh, you can't just jump in and do it because we need it today. I don't think we have the time to uh, go into depth about all of these things, but you're on the first step now because you're in the research phase uh, of what would be best for your community. And let me reiterate at this point that these are universal principles. These are not, well, Denver does this and we can replicate it. These are universal principles that you need to build so that they fit into the economic and political and structural natures of your offices and your communities. Um, it's very important to do your homework first. Identifying your strengths and weaknesses is about honesty of what your research and what your data is telling you. Your data, if you have it, great. If you don't have it, figure out the agencies that can get that data for you and identify strengths and weaknesses. This is the, my favorite part of all collaborations, and that is cross-training. Let me have an opportunity to tell you what it's like for me to be an investigator and let me listen while you tell me what it's like for you to be a healthcare professional working with trauma patients, uh, and on and on and on and on. And when that happens, it does something to the chemistry of relationships and collaborations. And that something is uh, really positive. It's time consuming. So you do that and you have these powerful teams and you set your goals and objectives, again, case by case. And you, uh, some of our cases are now, as I said, we don't close them, are now a dozen years old, 10 years old, um, a year old. And if you're not feeding those who are working hard for you by acknowledging successes along the way, Thank you notes, my old boss, Norm Early, who was the DA in Denver back in the 80s used to say, he sends out more attaboy, girl memos, this is before you did it on an email, uh, than he can shake a stick at. And so that was his way of, of letting staff know, the line staff know, and community members know that the work they're doing, the, the um, challenges they're taking on are appreciated. And, acknowledge, and acknowledgement is something that's basis to, it's basic to all of us. Uh, we're matching this up all along with the community readiness level that we talked about earlier. And here we go. And again, this is a great point, John, for me to stop and see if we've got some questions and uh, spend our time on um, the things that the audience may want to hear about. But let me leave you with this one thought. When you're impl implementing this program, this is not a linear concept. It is a circular concept. That means you have to be willing to re-learn, re-audit, rethink, redevelop, research, research. Uh, and you're always in a, in the private sector, they call it, uh, continuous quality improvement 
for total quality improvement. And that's what I am suggesting to you, that the job is never done. It's never done. John? Um, so Steve, if, uh, we haven't gotten any additional questions at this point. If, uh, if you do have any questions, go to that chat box at the bottom of the screen and then uh, click on that and you should get a chat box you can type your questions into and um, uh, we can uh, address those questions. Um, one question though, Steve, that um, regularly comes up amongst the folks that I work with is um, when you talked about threat assessments earlier, do you have any advice about uh, good threat assessments that may exist or how do you create one or tailor one to your own community? Uh, where do people begin with the threat assessment tools? Uh, um, I'm gonna suggest uh, a couple of resources. Uh, one is by a, um, a guy out of California who has done a lot of executive threat assessment work over the years and wrote a book about it. And the second is, about, is by a guy who has um, debriefed me after every major mass tragedy I've gone to. Uh, and has also written some uh, really good papers on threat assessment, and that's John Nicoletti. Um, but I'll provide you with that, as well as uh, the the template. I wouldn't call it a, 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 a tool necessarily that you'd fill in the boxes and check off the list, but it's a template that we use to make sure we touch on everything. By the way, I did not include in here uh, for the sake of time, the importance of uh, what we're all doing right now, which is using the internet. Social media is your friend when it comes to finding out what the bad guys want to do, because Lord knows they love putting it up on Facebook and Snapchat. I mean, every one of those things, which I am not expert at, but I have a staff person who is, so if you don't put social media skill set way into the depth of your toolbox, you're going to miss the boat, as well as it becomes a threat to you because the people you're trying to protect are feeling lonely, they're feeling isolated, they know how to use these things, and so they make the mistakes of just writing to Cousin Sarah or just writing to their best friend, Tony. Um, it's a really critical piece of this. And as long as I'm at it, one more piece I wanna add in, and that is uh, the institution of intelligence professionals within the criminal justice uh, corrections facilities. And that's both your local jails and your state prisons, as well as your federal system. Those people, often are the key to you maintaining protection prior to trial, during trial, and after during uh, the, the sentence that the offender receives. They are a source of information that makes it well worth your time. If you don't have those relationships, go build them. Go get them involved in this group. Don't forget to communicate with them how important they are to you. Uh, Steve, we did get a question uh, while uh, you were just uh, addressing those topics, um, and this one is related to uh, resolving conflict. Uh, how do you resolve conflict within task forces and coalitions? Do you have a protocol, a procedure, an approach to address this? You know, when you've been doing it for 43 years, you don't really go to the book very often for it, but in fact, we wrote one um, for our victim services collaboration that is wholly appropriate for uh, this setting. And I would be happy to include that uh, in the materials that we send off to you to use as a, a guidepost. But the basic principle of resolving conflict is to set aside your turf and listen. And if you can set aside your pre-existing beliefs or your turf and listen to what it is and why it is that people are disagreeing with you, 
uh, there is often a path to resolving this that's much easier than what it appears like when you start with that conflict. Now, I will exclude from that solution uh, politicians who have ulterior motives to, to create conflict because it's about the competition for offices and things like that. I, I haven't been very successful um, getting people who dislike each other or run against each other constantly uh, to put aside their differences because their considerations are not about what's best for the community, but what's best for their political ambition. Um, so I'll exclude that group. But if we're dealing with honest, let's sit down at the table and build, um, I, I like the way we approach things. Put yourself in the other guy's shoes. You know, one of those, what I learned in kindergarten things, for those of you old enough to remember that book. That's it. Okay, I think you're good. All right, all right. Did, um, okay, so did you have anything else, Steve? Yeah, uh, just in closing, um, you know, in, in a talk like this, a visit like this, is really to some degree a sales pitch to you that building a quality witness protection program would be a good thing for your community and for your victims. But I also understand that building it is a, a far cry more difficult than what I can rattle off in this hour. And so it becomes very specific to the uniquenesses of your community. And so I would suggest to you uh, that you take advantage of uh, Equitas and John and the rest of that team there uh, to try to build an opportunity for you to have a jurisdiction specific support program for the work that you're going to do. It's long, it's arduous, it's tough. Uh, it would be great to learn from people who've already made a lot of dumb mistakes rather than you making them the way we did. And so uh, that's my pitch for Equitas. And in closing from me, uh, just understand that even uh, putting together a Zoom training and webinar uh, takes the work of people behind the scenes. Uh, and for those of you who can hear me, uh, I am thankful that you made this as easy as you did. Thanks, Equipoise. Uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, before you go, one more um, budget. Uh, you talked about the... Um, that one case, and I, I know you have many cases, I think you guys uh, serviced something like 400 cases over the, the years yes. that you've been working. Uh, but the one case you talked about that required extensive work, what, what about budget? Where, you know, how do you guys afford all this? Where do you get the money? How do you convince whoever the funder is that this is important? Uh, how does that work? So we have a baseline in two things, one, uh, the elected district attorney in Denver has been committed and put their money where their mouth is in terms of the staffing of the program. Uh, when I was building the program, I had my choice of the best and brightest of our index investigative group, if I could go convince them that this is what they should focus their profession on. Uh, and so we did have basic staffing support that came from the DA's budget. Then we had the statute which reimburses a local jurisdiction for expenses uh, related to witness protection. And that's very helpful for emergency um, kinds of things. We also have uh, the good fortune in Colorado of having a uh, million dollar emergency fund for victims at the Colorado Organization for Victim Assistance. And so fast plane tickets, fast food, I don't mean fast food McDonald's, but having to get food quickly, having to get lodging quickly, having to get people to safely, safety quickly, and not having to worry about the fiscal aspects of it uh, is a matter of having a checking account that's, um, that's protected. It doesn't say 
Denver DA's witness protection program, and also having a credit card uh, that's well protected so that we can spend the money when we need to and know it'll come back to us. But the most important thing, and in that particular case, it was building relationships with agencies that had already had and obtained funding to do the kind of work that they do. And so you can call it for the sake of our discussion, in-kind commitments. But all of the mental health that this young woman received over the course of many years um, was in fact covered by the mental health funding nothing to do with criminal justice, mental health funding in the state that she moved to. And so you have to be able to build uh, a network of in-kind services of all the kinds that I mentioned over the course of the last hour, where their funding will pick up the services that your people need. And uh, when we add up the, co the actual costs that everybody took on for that case, it was well in excess of um, $100,000 to $200,000. I would say all in, we're probably pushing $300,000 in everybody's money that went towards it. Mm. That is not the common case. Right. The common case uh, is five grand and under. Right. Do you do have you done courtesy protection support for other states that where they're re relocated to Colorado or Denver? I'm glad you brought that up, John, because it's uh, I left off the slide about what we need to do nationally and what we actually have a growing collaboration to do, and that is to pass uh, a national bill for witness protection. There was one put on the table by Elijah Cunningham, uh, Elijah Cummings from Baltimore, who recently passed away, uh, that would have created a $30 million national fund and a training and technical assistance arm uh, for programs, uh, local programs across the country. Uh, one of the aspects of that bill has got to be the equivalent of a nationwide collaboration or cohort a, a, akin to what we do for supervision of offenders. Uh, an interstate compact, uh, we have one for probation and parole. We don't have one for witness protection, but I gotta tell you, it makes our job triple difficult if I've gotta go find someone in Tallahassee to take on my cases or in Oklahoma City or wherever it is. Um, and so we are very open and willing and have done uh, dozens of cases where we help out other jurisdictions uh, where their people are moving to Colorado or to Denver. That's awesome. Um, okay, uh, if there's no other questions, uh, then I'm just gonna say thank you, Steve, for this information. It's super helpful uh, and starts to get people thinking. Uh, and I wanna let folks know who are attending this uh, webinar that one of the best things I've been able to sit down with Steve when he's been assisting another site and had a back and forth talking with them about they had an existing program um, and so they had a bunch of questions about the best way to run it they were sort of new and up and run up and coming and um, he was able to really share with them good pieces of advice so if you guys uh, have an interest in chatting with Steve let us know and we will connect you uh, and he can uh, talk to you about your program, or if you're interested in starting a program, you don't already have one. Uh, some of the things that uh, he talked about generally here, he can help you with uh, some more specifics. So please reach out to us and um, we will connect you with Steve uh, for that purpose. Um, the webinar is recorded and we will, it will be available on our website uh, within a few days. And uh, all of the attendees will receive um, a hard copy of notes or materials uh, that uh, made up uh, this webinar. Um, so Steve, unless you have anything else, thank you very much. Thank you, John and team. We really appreciate you. Thank you guys uh, for attending and uh, participating. And we will now end the webinar. Thanks again. Bye now.